Good afternoon, how are you? Well, we have uh, a kind of chilly day, 55 degrees. Thomas Jefferson tells us the humidity is 51 and that the speed of the wind is eight miles an hour, although I, like usual, I don't feel that. Uh, what is the weather on the hill? Well, we're getting into more complicated matters now. And one of the reasons is because Trump led with one of his weakest nominees, perhaps to make a point. One of those points was, I'm in charge, you the Senate or not. But another is, I'm going to appoint people to take down government, because plainly that was what uh, our boy Gates was all about. There have been encouraging signs since, in the sense that some Senate Republicans are talking about scrutinizing Trump's picks. And that's a good sign because it shows the Senate by the Republicans asserting themselves rather than giving the knee to Trump, who wants to be, as he said, a dictator on the first day. So he sent picks that made it difficult for the Senate to compromise their constitutional authority and power to advise and consent on nominees. And there are several that fit the category of, really, do we want those people? And so, why do we have this process? Uh, we have to ask the question, why? But we have an answer. In the past, uh, I was special counsel for the Senate Labor Committee, uh, chaired by Republicans at the time, and Reagan was in the White House. And they proposed a labor secretary, Raymond, I don't know any mobsters, Donovan. And I said, I don't know any mobsters, because the issue was whether the FBI had withheld evidence that indicated that the labor secretary was associated with organized crime. Now, in that case, it was withheld by the FBI, and we have to assume that somebody in the White House didn't want the Senate Labor Committee to know that. And so he was approved. So the discretion of the senators was not informed by facts that were available, but withheld from them. Gates sort of fit into that, although his offenses were more spectacular. And we have a couple of people down the road and so it would make sense that Republicans, A, want to have responsible people handling the very difficult portfolio that comes with these cabinet positions. You know, we're talking about justice, we're talking about defense, we're talking about intelligence, welfare. And so that's a concern. Now, another thing that's going to haunt Trump and be difficult for our government to figure is Trump's belief that, hey, tariffs are the best thing since sliced bread in my powers as a president. But we did talk about how high tariffs for goods coming into the country gets passed on to families. And so the tariff becomes kind of a tax for them. But there's another dimension to this that we haven't discussed, that pits Trump against the wealthy. And it goes like this. Trump, in his first tour of duty, he put large tariffs out there, and there was a pushback from business for these. And he was using these tariffs to bar and shutter businesses offshore, forcing them, in his mind, to use American products. So it was a way to feather our own nest when there were apparently less expensive goods from foreign nation states that became diseconomic because of Trump's tariffs. Now, how did business handle that in, the, in his first uh, tour of duty, if you can call it that? And the way they, they handled it was they found a way 
not to suffer the high tariffs for certain businesses. And they gave exemptions from the tariffs to people who would use the import system to bring products into the United States. Now, how big a deal was that? There were hundreds of thousands of exemptions. There were 50,000 requests from China, whom we claim that we're hurting, unless it's an American business, sending from China to the United States goods that took advantage of, I don't know, inexpensive labor. But you see, labor is not what this is about. This is about a tool for the wealthy to protect their businesses domestically and exemptions to be able to send the goods that they make more cheaply offshore to the United States. Now, there were 500,000 exemptions for steel and aluminum. Imagine that. So Trump has threatened higher tariffs. But what he does is then he makes exemptions for his friends. We heard the very expensive way those in oil and gas could get benefits in the new administration if they supported his campaign. And so this is nothing new for him, although it's interesting that Trump used to say that he was going to come in and drain the swamp. And what he did was he set up lobbyists to set up these deals to do precisely what he claimed he came to eradicate. But that shouldn't surprise us. Uh, in terms of, uh, there are a whole bunch of issues that, that are kicking around on the weekend and the talking heads. But I didn't hear anybody talk much about the environment. And there's a lot of competing news, particularly what's going to happen next on the Hill, that kind of stuff. But we have an outgoing administration that reversed Trump's discord with the Paris Accords, <laughs> Accords uh, involving the environment. And so certainly Trump uh, did not attend these discussions that are winding up. And neither did Biden, our president, who had renewed our participation in the Paris Accords uh, after Trump had withdrawn. And the final uh, take is that the Accords ha are asking the developed nations, that's the United States, among others, to contribute $300 billion to developing nations to help them fight greenhouse gases and other environmental uh, toxins, if you will. Now, those who are critical of this sum say it really should be $1.3 And then the nice question is, among the top greenhouse gas offenders, we have the United States and we have China. Although China is still considered a developing nation, though we're a debtor nation to China, which explains some of what we do. So there, there we have a, a beautiful situation. And I'd say that there's an 83.4% chance that Trump will shit can the Paris Accords again and not agree to pay those funds. And so we're put at risk by his view that the science is nonsense when it's manifest all around us. The last thing that strikes my attention maybe doesn't disturb everybody, but I get upset around these seasonal times when public buildings are not open to the homeless, when meals are not provided, when tent cities are taken down, and at 55 degrees, which is today's temperature, uh, that feels a lot differently if you're static on the street in perhaps a tent. Now, I bring this up because there's a, a way that charity is provided that comes with a catch. And it goes like this. First, I want to go back to history a little bit. Uh, there were 8 million people who depended on potatoes 
when the Great Irish Famine struck Ireland and the potatoes ran black in the fields and the desperation was enormous. And in 1846 and years after, a lot of Irish came to the States. But those left behind in Ireland, some became what they call supers, which means the Protestants would open kitchens and the Irish, underlying Roman Catholic in the South particularly, the Irish would come in and pledge to be Protestant in order to be fed. Yes, outrageous and wrong. And it was considered that by those who were critical of this kind of bribery. And the soups were reportedly thin, if you will. And those who took advantage of this deal were described as they took the soup. Uh, I can't imagine what I would have done in that situation, but if you wonder if people have the strength when poor and suffering like that to fight, can they? In any case, I find out in Fairfax, Virginia, they have a place where they not only will give you food and lodging and community, but they have a Bible class. Uh, and a story in the Post that I read today described it as if, oh, it's just a coincidence. But the article itself was rife with the references to the good Lord taking care of these people. And this is a time of year when if each of us gave up a meal a week <laughs> and contributed a meal to the hungry or the funds to buy one, as happens in D.C., by the way, uh, we would be a different nation. The empathy that goes wanting in our country is certainly in violation of the words of Jesus they invoke. They who host some of these quid pro quo charities. The Sermon on the Mount, and I'm not religious, but the sense of it all is eminent that we should take care of the poor, the hungry, the homeless. And for those Christians out there who think this is just something that only Jesus could do, if you're a true believer, he said you will not enter the kingdom of God if you do not do this. So Christians, Roman Catholic, Protestant, Jews, any fa faith out there that conditions implicitly or expressly being charitable, loving another as one would oneself and withholding from them what they need but for their agreement to join a religion. So that's what I have to say. Uh, and I say good evening to you <laughs> from my Cathedral of Trees. All the best. Bye-bye.